Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's coming up this week on One Detroit Arts and Culture. The world-renowned Interlochen Center for the Arts celebrates a major milestone, plus a powerful new exhibition at Irwin House Gallery in Detroit. Then Detroit punk rock band Cinecide stake their claim as the first punk rockers in the Motor City. It's all just ahead on One Detroit Arts and Culture. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation and viewers like you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit Arts and Culture. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for being with me as we share in the exquisite arts and culture scene that we have here in Detroit and across Michigan. Coming up, we head to Northern Michigan and the Interlochen Center for the Arts. Talented students come from around the world to the Fine Arts High School, where we'll celebrate the completion of a campus master plan that began over 30 years ago. Plus, we'll take you to Irwin House Gallery in Detroit, where three artists joined forces for the exhibition called Triptych, Stronger Together. And then, how dissatisfaction with rock music brought us Detroit punk rock band Cinecide, and how the DIY rockers have evolved since the 70s. It's all coming up on One Detroit Arts and Culture. And we're starting off with one of the most prestigious fine arts high schools in the country, Interlochen Arts Academy. 30 years ago, Interlochen came up with a master plan, 16 facility projects to help the school evolve from a summer-only, music-only organization to the year-round multidisciplinary global arts and education institution that they are today. This fall, Interlochen celebrated the completion of that 30-year plan, in the only way they know how, with performances, readings, and showings by Interlochen students. I spoke with the president of Interlochen, Trey Devi. Trey Devi from Interlochen, it's great to see you and what a fantastic celebration uh, this fall, really the culmination of 30 years, a 30 year plan. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Christy. We couldn't be more proud of our community and the tenacity to get to this point over these three decades. Talk to us specifically about um, some of the facilities that stand out and how they are state of the art. The beautiful thing about each of the facilities is that our faculty and artistic leaders helped guide the development of those projects. So when you're in the writing house, as an example, and if you're interested in creative writing, um, I know every time I go in there, there's the fireplace, there's these small intimate nooks and crannies. You just want to write your first novel. Uh, the Music Center was the largest single project in the history of Interlochen. So that was a $24 million, uh, 60,000 square foot facility, uh, rivals anything that you would experience at the collegiate or the professional level. Uh, and then some of the more recent projects were the Dance Center right on the shores of Green Lake. Um, it's essentially this fishbowl, all glass, can see out to the water, can see the work of the dancers from uh, all over campus. But uh, um, because we engaged our artistic leaders, we ended up with facilities that were just really purpose designed for those students. Talk about the importance of expanding this kind of education, fine arts education for young people. Creative education is going to be one that will stand the test of time. The arts develop this level of resilience um, that our students are gonna need now and in, in the future. You know, We know that about half of our kids will go into the arts in some form and half of them will go into other fields, but they'll take their creativity with them wherever they go. 
So when you celebrated this major milestone, this 30 yeah. year master plan, of course, all of the students were a big part of that and the performance. Describe what the weekend was like. We brought all of our campus together. We dedicated the final two facilities, the dance center and the Dow house, which is the residence hall. Uh, and then we had a series of performances throughout the day on Friday, covering all of the disciplines in these various spaces. And so that was mm -hmm. that was amazing. And then we uh, came together again that evening, uh, and this was students, faculty, staff, uh, alumni, supporters, and uh, and we said thank you. Then we talked a bit about where we're going, and uh, we're we're. Um, seven years away from our 100th anniversary. And so we talked about how we want to be even more excellent for our students mm -hmm. and how we want to provide even greater access. So these two themes are really where we're going in the, uh, in the years ahead. I love when you talk about access and being able to expand. What are some of the maybe specific plans about getting to other areas and seeing this is an opportunity for you to be able to come here to Interlochen? We've started programs in various areas around the country. Detroit is an area of focus. We've got a program called Opportunity Scholars, which is essentially saying if you've got passion and potential and we see that promise in you, um, we don't want the, the price of interlocking to stand in the way. So there are scholarships that are available for students to come in the summer. Eventually, what we'd like to achieve is to meet the full demonstrated financial need of every young person who applies. So if you're accepted, we're going to meet your family's full demonstrated need. That's what we hope to do. And so between now and our 100th anniversary, it's our goal. When we enter our second century of interlocking, that's the, you know, that's the gift that we want to give to everyone in Michigan and really beyond. What do you see on the horizon of how the pandemic has changed the arts and how you have responded to that at Interlochen? Well, for one thing, we've we've begun virtual education. And over the last 18, 19 months, we've served about 3,000 young people through online education. And this has been a real um, opportunity for us to break down barriers and bring our faculty to, uh, to more young people. Well, we can't wait to see what happens in these next seven years, Trey, and we fully expect to check in with you along the way and then celebrate 100 years of interlocking very, very soon. It will be great. Oh, thank you, Christy. It's, uh, it's tremendous to be on your show. I really appreciate it. And for more on Interlochen Center for the Arts, just head to our website at OneDetroitPBS.org. All right, turning now to Irwin House Gallery in Detroit. A new exhibition begins this week where artist Jonathan Harris introduces emerging artist Crystal Starks Webb and Terrell Anglin in the exhibition called Triptych, Stronger Together. Our Bill Kubota spoke to the artist to find out the meaning behind the show. I had this idea of having a show, Triptych featuring Crystal Starks Webb, Terrell Anglin, and myself at the Irwin House Gallery. We're here at Irwin House Gallery and we've uh, continued to produce shows and uh, programming and just really try to work with and support as many Detroit local artists as we can. And we have been speaking with Jonathan about doing a solo exhibition of his work but he saw this as an opportunity, not just for himself, but to also uh, bring in two other emerging artists. I met Crystal first, because uh, she participated in an exhibit we had curated downtown, and um, her work was special to me because it was, uh, it was sincere. Like painting your children in those powerful positions of kings and queens, it was special. And uh, people wanted to see more of it. Terrell, his work is also sincere, and it is uh, it's different. And um, the world needs to see it. I think all art is inspiring. You can, you can get something that you love from each piece, um, um, from each artist. Uh, we're different, but that energy that um, comes out of uh, the artwork 
uh, allows me to um, use that same energy in, into my pieces as well. Um, I'm a pyrography artist, so it's, it's totally different. It's the use of heat, and I use a blowtorch. So, um, and then I use uh, acrylic paint to paint the background. I actually had to uh, do some research to um, kind of go with what I wanted to display. So, uh, I it took a lot of time, but I was patient about it. Nelson Davis is Harriet Tubman's husband, her second husband. And I thought to myself, what kind of guy you had to be to be married to an abolitionist, someone who lead, uh, led our people to freedom, you know? So um, my, my piece is based on that. Uh, this is a piece of my, for my family. Um, it's my grandmother and she adopted me. So she was my, my abolitionist as well. My focus is just telling a story uh, through my art. My daughter is honestly the one who got me into, um, back to painting, because I honestly gave up on it, um, on um, art. But um, a few years back, uh, she had an incident, an incident at school where they basically said there's something about her skin tone. And I, I was hurt by it. And then she got into this whole thing where she wanted to be lighter. And I, I wanted to show her that she was beautiful. So the reason she's in my work is because she inspired me to, to just show her like, hey, this is how I view you. And I want her to just see that she's, she's, she's beautiful. When people see it, they're just gonna take whatever they see. They're gonna see a person, a kid sitting on a bench right now in, in a garden, but they're not gonna know the story behind it um, until you see the other pieces. But still, sometimes a story can be seen um, in different views, you can get different points from it, but as far as the art is conveying exactly what it is, I think it's gonna be different from what people see. Um, this is a triptych as well. Um, this are, these are three pieces that work together and tell a story. This is at the far left, hear no evil, the middle, see no evil, and the right, speak no evil. Uh, it's basically just telling a story about uh, how I feel in America um, this, these days where it's, uh, it's so much of a negative influence everywhere and it's, it, it can sometimes be um, difficult to navigate um, even your own life. So that's why I had the stars and the red, white, and blue in the back. I want it to be beautiful, but still uh, engaging and people under try to you know, understand what's going on here. Um, that's a picture of my friend Kira, the black and white um, painting. Uh, that's actually uh, oil enamel that I used on that. And it's a drip painting. And the, the story behind that is uh, breaking the chain. It's a series I came up with the idea for to express everyday people breaking the cycle that uh, probably contaminated their family throughout the years. For this exhibition, I expect people are going to be floored. They're going to be moved by what these artists have been able to portray and express and just the range of their talent, um, the stories that they're telling through their arts, um, not only personal stories, but personal, but stories about, um, you know, Detroit life and about uh, black life in general. For more information on Triptych, Stronger Together, and Irwin House Gallery, just go to our website at OneDetroitPBS.org. All right, next up, Detroit has never been shy about its pioneering music scene, and that includes punk rock. So much of the music was self-produced and self-released, but rivaled the punk scene in New York and in L.A. One of Detroit's first punk bands is Cinecide. They formed in the mid-70s, and they're still making music today, even nominated for a 2021 Detroit Music Award. We didn't know a lot about Cinecide until our One Detroit editor, Chris Jordan, punk rock fan in his own right, who did some work with the band, introduced us. Wanna look, wanna let you see. Wanna speak, wanna let you say. Run it back, same as before. 
punk rock was really sort of a, um, a dissatisfaction about rock and roll. It became one thing, or it became a, a narrower thing, and it was um, it, w it was it was at the exclusion of anything else. Because you were passionate about music, we were passionate about music. Uh, you, you got angry, you know, passion, anger. You know, there's punk rock. There you go. Here comes one in 1976, the same year that the Sex Pistols and the Ramones released their first singles, Cinecide were, depending who you ask, Detroit's first punk band. We thought we were completely alone. You know, Detroit was filled with cover bands, you know, and, um, you know, just doing rock and roll uh, covers. You know, that just wasn't what I was looking for. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a good enough kick. We decided to make a record, Gutless Radio, which is sort of an anthem against radio at the time. As we discovered that there were uh, some other things going on in other parts of the country or um, or other parts of the world, uh, you would get wind of you know some sort of underground band or something, and you know there was just no possibility that they would play any of that stuff. I mean, it was sort of. Uh, you know, sort of brash. I mean, most bands in rock and roll would be, uh, you know, I want to be signed. I want the industry to love me. In our case, it was, we were, you know, sort of just slamming, slamming the industry with the idea that it would be, you know, we would do it yourself. We would issue our own records and things. They were one of the central bands in what became, by the early 80s, a thriving, eclectic, fiercely independent punk scene in Detroit. All the clubs, and there were a lot of them that were doing punk, um, they were full like every night. It didn't matter who played, in fact, a lot of you know, you know, know, kids would go to the bars just because they knew something was going to go on there. It was an eclectic scene, so you know, there was a nice spectrum of bands. It wasn't one thing, it was, you know, it could be bands that were uh, very roots oriented, or it could be bands that were, you know, more rock and roll, uh, a little electronica, you know, kind of stuff was sneaking in there. But, you know, it all I seemed to, the commonality was, you know, it had to be uh, a little raw, had to have a little bit of an edge. 45 years later, Cinecide are still going strong, are still totally DIY, and just released their eighth album with the pulp sci-fi inspired title track, Vegetable or Thin. This is, uh, this is a project that we worked on for a while, uh, actually before the pandemic, and then finished it up during the pandemic. Chris Gerard was in the band and played bass with us, and we recorded a lot of that with him in the band, and then he had health troubles, and Chris went on his hiatus, and we always thought that he would end up back in the band, uh, but things did turn for the worse, and um, he died. Just an amazing, amazing guy, a beautiful soul, a uh, great creator. He always had an innovative and interesting way to look at things. Uh, you know, maybe uh, two thirds of the record was, you know, with Chris or something, it was close to being done, but we kept putting it off and putting it off. We were mixing and things during the COVID thing. So essentially, uh, you know, we just stayed safe and, tried to be safe, but I thought we have to release this. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to not release it and we're just going to have to try different things like, um, like maybe we uh, could do our re-release <laughs> when the bar is open. Could... So being in the independent music scene, the Detroit punk scene for just about 45 years, how have you seen the scene change and how has your approach to making punk rock changed? You know, I don't know that I can say anything about a scene. I'm always interested in what's going on in Detroit. There's a load of great musicians, load of great people creating and making music and stuff. I mean, it's through all these different eras, through the 80s, 90s, 2000s now. I think that Detroit is sort of underplayed. It, it doesn't get the exposure that it should. Has your approach to writing punk rock changed? Is it still the same sensibility, the same spirit? 
I mean, cinicide is cinicide and it has a specific kind of sound, but I, I would say we evolve every, every time, every song. To me, punk was just about getting back to our roots, you know, stripping music down and being, uh, well, being fun, yes, being aggressive, it could be, but also, you know, respecting and understanding those roots, you know, and those roots could be anything from, uh, you know, some of the, the garage band sounds of 65, 66, or it could be rockabilly from the 50s, X from Los Angeles. Of course, I always appreciated the cramps, or it could be, you know, Hank Williams or Johnny Cash. You know, it could be any of that kind of stuff that you're bringing, bringing to a simplicity and a more directness. The music is just, for me, it just plays in my head, you know, so you plays in your head and then you just kind of, okay, try to work it out on an instrument and then boom, there it is. Maybe, you know, for us, maybe for me, it's just, you know, it's my personality. For more on our arts and culture stories and our live performances, just head to OneDetroitPBS.org for more, as well as on social media at OneDetroit. That is going to do it for me this week, but before we go, let's head to the Mary Grove Theater stage for a moving performance art piece by Sabrina Nelson. It's called Molting, and you can find out more about the piece on Detroit Performs Live from Mary Grove. I'll see you next week. Take care.
From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan, dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, and viewers like you.